between all these. But um, I'll go ahead and get started as people will be coming in. So everyone, it's good to see you again. Uh, it's another Tuesday night and we're doing our weekly apologetics meeting. Um, I know some of you have all obviously been on here for a while. We've been doing these ever since Ohio State. Uh, doesn't allow us to meet in classrooms. And so we started doing Zoom way back in March of last year. We can't go on campus. We were there this week. We are doing some tabling. So that's been going very well. We're going to be back there tomorrow, but we haven't been able to be out and have official events and like be do the classroom apologetic uh, meetings on site. So a lot of you um, have been coming on here. We appreciate it. Now we do have some people on here. Obviously they're not from Ohio State because we've opened it up to others who want, who are interested in some of these topics we've been doing. We've had a lot of good scholars on, a lot of good apologists, a lot of great topics. So tonight uh, we're just as privileged to have another uh, very, uh, really uh, a, someone that's really contributed a lot to uh, the field of not only apologetics, but philosophy of religion. And uh, Dr. Tim McGrew is with us. Um, do, uh, Dr. McGrew, I kind of met actually online. Uh, we met uh, years ago in an apologetics uh, group online. And we started interacting a little bit on some messian and prophecy things. Um, you know, Dr. McGrew is very interested in uh, history and evidentialist uh, apologetics. And I I'd studied that stuff for years being a background Jewish mission. So we kind of interacted on some of that. So I've known him for a while. Um, haven't seen him in a while. I saw him at a conference once, but he's in Michigan. We're in Ohio, so we're not too far away. But he's also involved with Ratio Christie. I think you do you have a chapter up there in your, we do. In your location? Yes, yeah, we do. Western I'll be speaking Michigan. for them uh, later this month or next month. Yeah, so he's involved with uh, campus ministry there too, and uh, he's just got a very busy schedule. He teaches uh, full time at uh, Western Michigan. He's been there for I think over twenty five years. Am I correct? That is yeah. correct. Yeah. Yeah, he's been there a long time, and so if you take philosophy there, you're going to be uh, studying under Dr. McGrew and uh, his wife Lydia uh, is well known too. She's written some books in uh, apologetics and philosophy of religion. So, and they both write together um, and collaborate on some issues. I just want to pull up a couple slides here on Dr. McGrew so we can kind of. Just uh, real quickly, uh, you can see um, a little bit more about him. I like to do this to kind of acquaint, get people acquainted uh, with who he is. So um, that's him, of course. And uh, as I said, he teaches at Western Michigan University, where he's taught for 25 years. Um, his research interests are epistemology. That's the study of knowledge and uh, philosophy of religion. And he also has done a lot on uh, history or historical apologetics. Um, and uh, philosophy of science, as you see here. So, and he's got some hobbies, as you can see here. He likes to run the trails and he's very good at chess from what I understand. So if you like chess, you wanna to get together with them. Um, I, I can state to say he would kick, kick my uh, rear. So I don't wanna talk about that, but anyway, he's supposed to be very good at chess. Now, I also wanna mention that um, he's also contributed, he and his wife contributed a really important chapter in the uh, Blackwell Companion philosophy uh, or the Natural Theology Companion here, Blackwell Companion Natural Theology. It's on the resurrection. Um, it's a great article and you can get it online. I'll show you the title of it and then you can download it. I, for some reason, they've made it accessible online for a long time. <laughs> and I guess, I don't know if Tim's happy about that, but anyway, it's been there for a while and a lot of people can read it. Uh, Dr. McGrew, I actually uh, have this book, The Nature and Miracles of Jesus. Um, I know that's not quite as well known as the Blackwell Companion, but I actually picked that up last year and I read your uh, your chapter in that. So I'm familiar with that chapter as well. If you wanna get the article he and his wife, uh, Lydia wrote on the resurrection, you can type this uh, this title in online, uh, The Argument for Miracles, The q and Case for the Resurrection of Jesus. And uh, you can read the whole thing. Uh, the chapter is online, but it's an excellent chapter. It'll equip you more on how to talk about the resurrection, deal with some of the heavy questions, some of the philosophical objections, some issues with miracles, which we'll be talking about tonight. So make sure you uh, pick that up if you want to familiarize yourself with that. So also, if you go on YouTube, uh, type in Dr. McGrew's name. Uh, he's got all kinds of presentations. You know, he's been speaking a lot. He's got a lot of presentations on the Gospels, reliability of the Gospels, other topics. And so just type in his name. He's actually done an online debate with Bart Ehrman. You know, we've talked about Bart Ehrman. We've had Mike Lacona on here. He's, you know, debated Bart as well. Some uh, Dr. McGrew's done an online debate with him. I think that had to be at least five or six years ago, maybe three or four years ago, but uh, I'm not sure the exact date, but it's pretty interesting. You can listen to that. So um, we're really happy to have Dr. McGrew on here. And you know, this is exciting because the topic tonight is so relevant. And I just want to say that, um, you know, that uh, if you're not familiar with this topic, if it's your first time talking about learning about miracles tonight, the uh, sto or the uh, importance of miracles, that's okay. You know, everyone's, we got to start somewhere. And also, Make sure you look at this, the Library of Historical Apologetics. 
that is a website that uh, Dr. McGrew has uh, worked very hard on with others. And there's a whole just encyclopedia of articles on the history of apologetics, like stuff going back to the 1700s and 1800s. And just before, you know, sometimes I think people think apologetics started with like William Lane Craig or Norm Geisler. I mean, apologetics has been going on for centuries. And so there's all kinds of resources on there. So go on that website and it's all alphabetized and you can just find all kinds of stuff. And I know that Dr. McGrew is a big fan of the older stuff. And he will tell you that uh, he really likes to read some of the older apologetic works and there's reasons for that. So I appreciate that very much. Take a look at that. Okay, just wanna mention as we talk about miracles tonight, I know some more people are coming in here, um, that you know there are some books out here, just, just based, I just wanna mention a couple of things. If you're just getting started on this topic, um, before I start talking to Dr. McGrew directly about it, you can get some of these books there. there some of them are older, some of them are more current. Um, you know, like Miracles in the Modern Mind by Norm Geisler or the book In Defense of Miracles by Habermas there on the far right. Um, Hume's Abject Failure. Um, I know Dr. McGrew knows that one very well. And this Robert Lar uh, Larmer book, I think it's how you pronounce his name. And then Craig Keener's Double Volume on Miracles. Um, there's just a lot of uh, work that has been done. And then you've got like Lee Strobel's popular work, The Case for Miracles. Um, You've got this book by uh, Robert Hutchinson. I read that book, and a scientist believe in miracles. So, you know, just if you're just getting started on this, you want to learn more. I encourage you to get some of those works if you just want to kind of dive in uh, further. And just, I just want to mention that just a couple intro slides before I go to the questions. I think that we uh, hopefully know uh, one of the reasons we're doing this topic tonight is because you know, not as uh, the Russell says here in his book, uh, Jeffrey uh, Russell is kind of a a Q&A book on objections to Christianity. He says that a non-miraculous Christianity is historically and philosophically not Christianity at all. And Thomas Jefferson and other well-meaning people edited the Bible to take out the miracles or else to explain the miracles away in pseudoscientific terms. So sipping out miracles out of the Bible is like taking the battles of Beowulf or Liberty out of the Declaration of Independence. And so hopefully we all know that our faith really uh, is, you know, without the miracles, I mean, you know, we've got a real challenge with our faith. If we don't believe in the miraculous, or we can't explain the miraculous. So this is a big part of our faith. And so, you know, it plays a huge role in our worldview and our apologetic. And, you know, I found this, uh, this survey, ironically, back in 2008. I just wanted to see how many Americans really believed in miracles. And there are a large amount of people uh, in our culture that still believe in the miraculous. This was a survey that was done. You can get that online there. But people of 45 and over do believe in miracles. But, um, you know, this, the circles that Tim and I, or Dr. McGrew and I run in, and maybe others here, you know, not everyone does believe in the miraculous. There's a lot of skeptical objections. And of course, when you're in academia, like Dr. McGrew, as he runs into this a lot, and there are still a lot of people that have objections to miracles. And so, that's what we want to talk about tonight, okay? So just because a lot of people believe in it doesn't necessarily mean there's nobody out there that has any objections. Okay, well, um, so let's start with um, some, like, defining a miracle. So Dr. McGrew, I had a couple definitions I gave to you, um, just a couple of standard definitions. One was by um, Francis Beckwith. I know you know who he is. He is, uh, he gives a definition here, a divine, he defines a miracle as a divine intervention that occurs contrary to the regular course of nature within a significant religious and historical context. Um, Lewis, uh, C.S. Lewis has a definition here. Um, he uses the word miracle to mean an interference with nature by a supernatural force. And then uh, Lacona, uh, Mike Lacona, who you know, kind of gives it a little kind of similar to maybe Beckworth a little bit. He says, I define miracle as event in history uh, for which natural explanations are inadequate and propose that we may identify a miracle when the event is highly unlikely to have occurred and uh, given the circumstances, owner or natural law and occurred in an environment, context, charge, or religious significance. So do you like those definitions or do you do more with that? Or what do you think? Just one. Yeah, so I think each of those definitions is in the zone of what I would use because I do a lot of interacting with people who are atheists. I like actually to use uh, a as a springboard, a definition of the laws of nature that J. L. Mackey uses. J. L. Mackey was an atheist professor at Oxford University, and uh, Mackey says the laws of nature describe the ways in which the world works when left to itself, when not interfered with. So there, you can see the crossover with C. S. Lewis's definition 
um, there's an intervention going on. A miracle occurs when the world is not left to itself, when something distinct from the natural order as a whole intrudes into it. So a miracle is something nature doesn't do by itself. When nature is left to run its course, miracles don't occur. This is why dead people stay dead and virgins are not pregnant. That's just the natural way of things. A miracle is an event that can't be brought about in those ways. And therefore, when we believe that we have encountered a miracle, we look for some significance to that. We ask ourselves, is this a sign of something? Is this a wake up call? Is somebody telling us to pay attention to something? So that's the way that I would get at it. And I, I would say David Hume, the famous skeptic who no doubt we'll be discussing here shortly, has a different definition of the laws of nature. And so I, I would use this one, that laws of nature describe the way the world works when left to itself. Because number one, I think it's a good definition. And number two, nobody can accuse me of just picking out some religious believers definition because this is the definition given by an atheist philosopher. Mm -hmm. Okay. Would you, now, um, one thing I just want to mention about these definitions, would you agree that it's very important we define a miracle? There has to be like a, there's always the need for religious or historical context to that miracle versus like believing in some weird, like some people might compare miracles. Like I have up here, um, this slide, I kind of skipped because it wasn't really, but you know, when people think of miracles, sometimes they think of like superstition or like ghosts or fairies or Zeus or Thor, weird things that happen within the world. I mean, those those don't really have a lot of sometimes an historical religious context sometimes. So is that important in defining a miracle to get a context involved there? There are two different ways to approach that. One of the ways to do that is the way that Lacona and uh, Beckwith. Beckwith are doing yeah, it. Beckwith, but sorry. but the, uh, the way that I would probably approach it would be to get sort of to the same point by saying, first, let's take the, the leaner definition of a miracle, the one that J.L. Mackey gives, that it occurs when the world is not left to itself. And then we can distinguish between things that might count in that sense as miracles, but wouldn't really be terribly interesting, right? God, because he is bored, causes some grain of sand in the Sahara to shift in a way that it wouldn't according to the ordinary laws of nature. And nobody notices, and it doesn't signify anything, and so what, right? That's, right. that's a miracle, but it's a boring miracle. It's not a miracle that does anything. The miracles that interest us are miracles that are used as signs. And the word sign is a big word in the Gospel of John. Mm -hmm. uh, what is it that these miracles are doing? They're showing you something. They're pointing to something. They are telling you, hey, pay attention here. This isn't just nature left to itself. Something else is happening. And this is the time when if you've been sleeping in class, you should wake up because there's something going down here that you need to take note of, you need to figure out the significance of. Mm. If God wanted to get our attention, how could he do it? Well, he could write a really beautiful song, but there are ordinary humans who write really beautiful songs. He could pen a fantastic poem, but who's to say that some human genius couldn't have written a great poem? He could give us really outstanding moral advice, but some good people have given good moral advice. How could we tell it was from God and not just from someone very talented, very gifted? By one means only. Something happens that nature itself, including ourselves as parts of nature, can't do. Then God's got our attention. And the more that we know about nature, what it can do and what it can't do, the better able we will be to pay attention to that. The central miracles of Christianity are the kinds of things that nobody would be inclined to write off as just the way that nature is, but we haven't noticed, right? Dead people crucified by professional Roman killers stay dead. That's, that's not really sort of a debatable point in esoteric science where like, I don't know, I need another degree in physics before I can figure that out. No, that's, that's kind of basic. We get that one. Okay. I like that a lot. Yeah. To get people's attention. Very good. Um, so I know we probably run into this a lot where you know, people are interested in Jesus, um, or they might show some interest in Jesus, you know, where, you know, they're open to his teaching, they like his ethics, uh, things like that. But for some reason, then when it comes to the, uh, the miracles in the Gospels, you know, and of course, this has happened in scholarship throughout history, as you know, a lot of times the miracles are seen as simply symbolic, they didn't really happen. 
um, you know, they're interesting, but they're not really la factual things, you know? And so um, do you think that that uh, is still, I mean, I know I run into this on campus still. I run into people that are interested in Jesus sometimes, but then they're like, well, I don't know about that stuff in the gospels. I mean, I'm walking on water and that kind of stuff. And so this kind of leads me to my, I'm leading into my next slide. And so people like scholars, I've noticed New Testament scholars don't have a problem seeing Jesus as like some sort of exorcist or like does really amazing, maybe some sort of healings or exorcisms or something, you know, it's a, it's not really debated that much, but it seems like the problem they have are these things, you know, the, the nature miracles, the things like walking on water and feeding the 5,000, things like that. So why do you think um, this still kind of carries on today? Is it just mostly the, the hangover of a philosophical kind of naturalism, or is it just a combination of history with academia or what, what's going on there? That's, is it still out there as much as ever? Do you still see it? In certain forms. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that it is very much a philosophical position rather than something to which we're driven by criteria of sober history. There is a philosophical position that has a long history that says miracles either just do not happen, that's one kind of crude version of it, or miracles could never be reasonably believed if they were reported. And that's a kind of a funny thing. It's one thing to say, if you told me that your Uncle Joe rose from the dead, I'd be skeptical and you'd have to give me a fair amount of evidence. That's fine, right? Every, everybody kind of gets that, yeah, if it were Uncle Joe, we, we kind of need that evidence. But if we're going to say uh, there is no evidence, no matter how much evidence you give me, that could make it reasonable for me to conclude this, then that's that's kind of funny. That's doing history a priori. That's determining that what we shall believe can be settled in advance of looking at the evidence. Mm -hmm. uh, look, I'm a philosopher and the, one of the patron saints of philosophy is Socrates, this guy who actually had to admonish his followers follow the evidence wherever it leads, even if it's leading somewhere you didn't expect it to, even if it's leading somewhere that you don't particularly like, you've got to follow the argument. Mm -hmm. And so to say, you've got to follow the argument except for miracles, then you can just sort of put your hands over your ears and go, la, 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 I can't hear you. I don't have to listen to your evidence. That's really weird. Mm -hmm. Even if you start out thinking this miracle report doesn't really look credible to me, at least be open enough to be able to be persuaded. There are a lot of miracle reports I don't accept, but I don't want to be the kind of person who could not accept them no matter how much evidence came rolling in. So this philosophical assumption that says you can never rationally believe them or such things could not happen is really not something that is underwritten by the evidence. It's something that's undergirded by a prior philosophical commitment, a commitment to naturalism that says, the physical world with physical causes is all there is. Mm -hmm. So if a miracle is defined as something that takes place when the physical world is interfered with, then since there's nothing out there to interfere with it, miracles don't happen. Okay, well, that's, that's a short and easy way with it. But how sure are you of your naturalism? Is it the kind of thing that's based on evidence or is it something that you just insist upon without reasons? That's really a crucial question. Right, right. Yeah, it's, it's mostly uh, just a philosophical issue that carries on and on. Um, I agree. Now, I know that you have heard this objection, and I, I can tell my history of doing uh, apologetics at a highest state and elsewhere. This is in the top three I've heard over the years. I don't, <laughs> I think I answer must, but it's like once a week it comes up. But there seems to be this view, you know, that people think that they're owed something from God, that, you know, the signs that have been given through Jesus' resurrection and through creation and through what we're talking about are just not good enough and they deserve something more. And I saw you answer this once. <laughs> I remember this, this was online years ago. We were in a discussion somewhere with some other people and, and you said, maybe, maybe uh, God knows something you don't. <laughs> I thought that was kind of funny. I remember that. So that's how that I made an impression on me. So I was wondering, um, I'm sure you've heard this before, but why do you think people think that they are kind of owed a greater sign or like my dad says to me, you know, they did all those miracles took place in the gospels. That was 2000 years ago. Why doesn't God do something major today? You know, some sort of sign today to get our attention or to me personally, you know, so I can really know if he just gives that to me, I'll, I'll believe I will yield my life to Christ, you know, 
But I always tell them that, you know what, you really don't know how you're going to respond. You assume you do. And so, you know, as, as you say, Dr. McGregor, maybe God knows something they don't. So, I mean, you run into this a lot, right? This objection. Yeah. So I, I would say um, there's a Jewish secular playwright, Patty Chayefsky, who wrote a play called Gideon's back in the 1960s, I believe. And it's got a fascinating scene. Gideon has already, you know, followed God's call. He's become a successful leader. Uh, but then for a while, like, God's not been talking to him. And so he's out on the threshold, threshing floor. And then the angel of the Lord appears to him and, and like life is good. He doesn't really need this kind of interruption. So he says, let me go, God. And the angel says, let you, Gideon, whatever does that mean? There is no divorce from God. I, I'm, I'm real. I'm standing before you palpably as real as a rock. Mm -hmm. And Gideon says, I, I, Lord, I see you and I hear you. So I pray, go from my sight that I might say God is a dream, a name, a thought, but not a real thing. And the angel says, but I am a real thing. And mm -hmm. Gideon says, I would pretend that you are not. Mm -hmm. I think we underestimate the extent to which we might make that response if we got an actual sign from God. We're all inclined to think well of ourselves, to think that we're the kind of people who would have no trouble with any obligation, any responsibility that was laid upon us if we came face to face with God Almighty. When Abraham comes face to face with God, God says, walk before me, be holy. And Abraham falls on his face. Mm -hmm. This is not a light thing. If you really demanded a miracle, what else might change in your life? Might you be called to be holy in ways you're not real keen on being? Might you say, like Gideon in the play, uh, go from my sight. Let me pretend that you're a dream or a name or a thought, but not a real thing. I don't think we're as honest as we think we are. And God does tend to work miracles for those who are ready to accept what's happening. I'm not persuaded that miracles never happen today. There is a body of evidence. You mentioned Bob Larner, Larmer, uh, Craig Keener. They've got some accounts, each of them in their books that they list of things from people that they've actually known. Mm -hmm. And although I don't think there are any people with the power of just working miracles, I am not persuaded that they have to have ceased altogether. Mm -hmm. So there may be people who get signs like that. I am not one of them. Um, do You're I need, <laughs> do I need a miracle? Do I need to be shown a sign like that? Or do I already have enough evidence? I think the answer is I have enough. And if I insist sort of petulantly, but other people sometimes seem to get these, why can't I have one? Mm -hmm. Then uh, what I'm showing is that I'm not content with the evidence that I have, which if it is enough, is certainly all that I need and tells me enough to make me morally obligated to do certain things, to behave in certain ways. I don't really need a miracle. Now, somebody who's a soldier in the army in Egypt and begins worrying that maybe Christianity is true, but has no contact with Christians all around him, maybe he needs a miracle. Maybe mm -hmm. he needs a miraculous sign. I don't. Mm -hmm. So for me to get all snooty about it and say, I demand that you give me a miracle. Well, what standing do I have to tell Almighty God that I need more than the adequate evidence he's already given me, if it is adequate? Now, fair question to say, but is it good enough? Okay, let's talk. That's a great question. But if it is enough, then for me to go around insisting that I personally have more, it's really weird. There's something wrong with me if I'm doing that. Yeah, I think I ran into this more, as you, as you know, with uh, skeptics or agnostics, you know, not not content with the evidence that, that is there. And so they think they deserve more. So and as right. you said, we can go over the evidence with them if they're interested. But it's very interesting. Um, they're kind of demanding about it, too. Well, um, isn't there a line from isn't there a line from Jesus Christ Superstar? Uh, I think it's Herod at the past. He says, Jesus Christ, if you're no fool, come walk across my swimming pool. Right. <laughs> isn't that the. Uh, yeah, I think I saw that. Shot. I think I did see that. I took anyway. That's I have a story behind taking someone to see that, but that's for another time. But yeah, that's right. Um, okay. Well, um, anyway, uh, so let's talk a little bit about David Hume. Um, you know, since he comes up everywhere. So, just for the listeners that are on for the first time, um, 
Tim, can you quickly tell us why people today, their rejection of miracles overall, I say still to this day, go back to something David Hume said. It's related to him. Why has he had such an impact as he has? Right. So uh, you've got two of Hume's books up on the slide. There's more than that. But But the one that actually has had the greatest impact in this is yet another one, first published in 1748 under the title Philosophical Essays, later retitled An Enquiry Concerning Human Understanding. Um, Hume has an essay in the enquiry called Of Miracles. Mm -hmm. And that essay is short. It was probably written when he was a younger man and then just bundled into this collection of essays later. And it has been wildly influential. In it, he doesn't quite say miracles do not happen. That would be a hard sell because Hume is an empiricist. He believes that this is a matter of fact. You can't rule it out by pure speculation. So what he settles for instead is saying the evidence against a miracle is always greater than any evidence that there could be for it. And therefore, since in any contest of evidence, we must follow the greater evidence, you must always disbelieve reported miracles. Mm -hmm. He doesn't actually engage with the question what you should do if one happens right in front of your nose, but he's counting on the majority of his readers not even claiming that. And so he's ready to try to dissuade them from that. And he does so uh, in ways that I think you're about to quote, because I see you've got in Hume's own words. So that essay, yeah, that at one. first, it was, uh, it, it was shot down by some of his contemporaries. And then in the 19th century, it regathered steam. It was a major influence on the German skeptic, David Friedrich Strauss. And in his new life of Jesus, Strauss comes right out and names Hume, although you can see the influence even in his earlier work. And it was a major influence on T.H. Huxley, Matthew Arnold, all of these skeptical guys, and uh, F.H. Bradley, Ernst Trulch. It really became sort of the assumed position in German biblical scholarship. Of course, miracles are incredible. Therefore, if we're going to understand the New Testament at all sympathetically, we have to demythologize it, take the miracles out, look at it with eyes that are unencumbered by these fantasies that an uncritical uh, set of people put together. And so how are we supposed to do that? That's the process of stripping out all of the things we can't believe, leaving as much of the moral teaching as we can because we still want to profit from Jesus' moral teaching. Although I think really if people stopped and thought hard about some of Jesus' moral teaching, they might back off on that and say, you know, maybe I would take the miracles and leave the moral teaching. That's kind of convicting stuff. Mm -hmm. But but yeah, Hume has influenced biblical studies in an outsized way. And the really curious thing is that it's only in the very late 20th and early 21st century that there's been a bit of a turning of the tide. And even people who are not committed to Christianity, people who are agnostic or atheist, have said, yeah, Hume's argument, not all that it was cracked up to be. Hmm. Okay. Um, so you would, but you would agree that he probably is, out of all the people that really influenced people's views of miracles, that he's been the big gun. Mostly, I mean, he's been the best. Absolutely. Athlete. He's number one. Yeah. Yeah. Nobody else even comes close. And in philosophy, too, right? Philosophy yeah. of religion, too. Okay. Not just biblical yeah. studies. So, right. what about this argument he puts right here, this one about uniform experience? What's wrong with that view? Um, one of his quotes there, you know, having uniform experience against every miraculous event. I mean, what there's, it seems kind of circular to me, but what, what do you think about that? Um, I know you're familiar so, with it. Right. So, let's try to put this in concrete terms. Okay. I'm going to assume that you have never seen a dead person come to life. Certainly not someone who is totally dead. Maybe somebody who's mostly dead, right? Thank you, Princess Pride reference, but not somebody who's completely dead. So we're that's something that doesn't lie within your experience, my experience, maybe the experience of all the people watching. Mm-hmm. So to that extent, in our experience, we haven't seen this. And as a uniform experience, he says, amounts to a proof. There is here a direct and full proof from the nature of the fact against the existence of any miracle. Nor can such a proof be destroyed or the miracle rendered credible, but by an opposite proof, which is superior. Now, 
that's an odd line of reasoning. Let me give you an illustration. There are theories in contemporary physics, which we have not been able either to verify or to falsify, that say that protons very, very rarely spontaneously decay into more fundamental particles. Really, really, really rarely. And to try to determine whether this has happened, scientists have set up underground tanks of water isolated from other influences with detectors set around the rim to try to see if we can catch sight of a proton decaying spontaneously. None has ever been seen to decay spontaneously, but we wouldn't really expect to have seen them because, did I mention, these events are really, really, really rare. And yet, if we got a positive signal from one of those and we say, hey, you know what, the detectors spotted a proton decaying in just the way predicted by that theory, we would take the evidence seriously. If you said a uniform experience, like our uniform experience of never seeing protons decay spontaneously, amounts to a full proof, then why are we looking for evidence at all? Why don't we just say, eh, you know, detectors sometimes malfunction and we've never seen a proton decay, so we're just going to give it up. But we don't do that. If you really use the kind of reasoning that Hume gives here, you would be actually cutting off the possibility of learning certain things in science itself, outside of religious contexts. So this is there's got to be something wrong with that. People accuse religion of being a science stopper. But this is really a science stopper. This one really prevents you from coming to know certain truths if in fact they are true. Here's another problem with it. If a miracle is to function as a sign, it has to be something that nature can't do by itself. Suppose that we discovered that very occasionally in the population, somebody had the ability to turn water into wine, would make you very popular on the campus of Ohio State, I'm sure. So, you know, maybe one person in every 100,000 can do this. And then we pick up the Gospel of John. We read about this happening at Cana where Jesus is supposed to have turned water into wine. What would we say? Oh, he was just one of those rare people who can do this. Cool. That's, that's okay. But that, then is there anything about him that we need to pay attention to? Does that indicate that he's specially commissioned by God, that he has a message that we need to hear? No, nothing like that would follow at all. For a miracle to function as a sign that draws our attention to someone or to some teaching, it has to be something that's not just a rare event. It has to be something unprecedented that all of our knowledge of nature tells us nature can't do alone, which means there's got to be a uniform experience of the way nature works in which it doesn't happen for it to stand out against that background. If it can't stand out against the background, it can't function as a sign. Look at your slide. You have white print on a black background. What if you had typed that entire quotation out in a black font on your black background? We couldn't see it as any different from the background. If a miracle doesn't stand out from the background of how nature behaves when left to itself, we can't tell that it's something that isn't just nature operating. So of course, there's got to be a natural order in which dead men stay dead, in which water doesn't spontaneously turn into wine, in which virgins are not pregnant, in order for a virgin birth or a turning of water into wine or a resurrection from the dead to catch our attention and say, whoa, something's going down here. I need to sit up and take notice. Of course, there has to be a uniform experience that tells us that's not how nature works. So far from being a devastating argument against the existence of a miracle, a background in which things like that don't happen is exactly what we have to have for it to serve its function as a sign. Right. Christians have been shouting from the rooftops that the resurrection and the virgin birth are miracles. And then along comes David Hume, and he thinks he can totally baffle us by saying, you know, you know there's something a little bit odd about these events. Yeah, yeah. we know. Right. Right. They're not supposed to be something that happens all the time, obviously. That wouldn't make any right. sense. Right. So, so they have to be rare if they're going to function as they're supposed to function. 
I once had an atheist at a high state. It's funny. He was he was running around to the campus ministries and it was real crowded, nice outside. And he was he was thought he was real snarky and funny. He'd say, hey, have you, have you ever seen a man rise from the dead? Hey, have you ever seen a resurrection? Hey, have you ever seen one rise from the dead? He was going around like pointing at people and and uh, he, he thought he'd get us, you know, in the Hume argument, even though he didn't know he was borrowing from Hume, but he was. Mm-hmm. And he thought it was really unique with his argument, like something new he was saying. And I was like, yeah. this is exactly what he was doing. So he just missed the whole point of what a miracle is. It's a very rare event. And it's not something that uh, it is supposed to get your attention. And it's not something like Uncle Johnny and Grandpa Bob rise from the dead all the time. It wouldn't be that unique. Right. So, um, so what about Hume's arguments about uh, the testimony of others? I'll just apply this to the resurrection real quick. So. He says here, no miracle in history has been attested by a sufficient number of men as such unquestioned good sense, education, learning, as to secure us against all delusion in themselves of such undoubted integrity as to place them beyond all suspicion of any design to deceive uh, deceive others. So is he kind of saying that when you have all these eyewitnesses to like the resurrection, something like a miracle event, that there's no way you could ever, you just never get the amount of witnesses you want. You can't trust eyewitness testimonies. He just, they're not educated. They're not learned. I mean, is he kind of just ruling that out ahead of time, more or less? Yeah, I mean, peasants, right. you can't trust them, right? So let's think about this. Let's, again, get concrete, because I think a lot of times this stuff sounds most plausible when it's at an abstract level, and when we get more concrete, right. then things start happening. So uh, everybody here, just think about this. Can you remember a time when you saw uh a a good friend from high school when you like spent a day hanging out with somebody that you knew really well um go ahead if uh if you know how to do the little uh hand raise thing you can go ahead and try that you can uh raise your hand and say you know yeah i I remember hanging out if they don't if they don't they do but anyway (laughs) if they don't it clearly means that they don't have any friends Um, (laughs) there you go there's one can't all right yay can you think of a time when you hung out with somebody that you knew well that you know it's your friend okay so i've got two questions for you and uh, y- you are free to tell us whether you are of such unquestioned good sense and one. learning all right i see that hand as they say in the revival services um <laughs> two questions for you all right number one are you sure that it was your friend and not a robot or someone who kind of looked a bit like your friend? Are are you sure it was really your friend? Do you think you could swear? Yeah, that was really my friend. That was not just somebody who kind of looked similar. That wasn't uh, a robot. That was actually my friend. Do you think you're competent? Do you think you've got such knowledge, such unquestioned good sense that you are able to say that? Right. How much how much education does it take for you to say, yeah, that was my friend? Right. Second question. If you're sure it was your friend, are you absolutely sure? Do you have enough scientific knowledge to be able to say that during that day that you hung out out with them, your friend was alive and not dead? Or is that really something you would need an advanced medical degree to be able to tell? Because that's it. That's what we're talking about here. We're not talking about diagnosing, oh, I don't know, you've got cramps and it's been like, oh, maybe that's endometriosis. Let's do some uh, tests in the lab. No, no, this is not like some esoteric thing. This is just, it was their friend and he was alive and not dead. That's all you need. So what Hume is doing here is really kind of playing a rhetorical trick on us. He's making us say, oh, yeah, well, we wouldn't want to be suckers. We wouldn't want to fall for just anything that peasants might say. But when you look at what they're really being asked to testify to, it's not something that crazy. It's something really straightforward. And everybody in this Zoom meeting thinks you're competent to render a judgment on those things. Was it really your friend that you know? And was it really your living friend and not just a corpse? That's, That's all we're talking about. So I think this is one of the most successful pieces of misdirection in all of philosophy. Well, such unquestioned good sense and education and, you know, come on, this isn't rocket science. This is actually something pretty basic. And all of us think that we're competent to be able to render a judgment on that. The things in question are obvious kinds of things. They're not fancy. 
So I'm just completely unimpressed so, by this argument. Yeah, so basically you're saying like the bedrock of one of our human endeavors is the trust the testimony of what we say. I mean, we have to be able to use testimony and trust our senses on things. And so, Hume, but this, but what about something, I mean, Tim, wouldn't he say, well, a miracle claim is different than you going out with your friend? I mean, come on. I mean, that's totally different. I mean, that's a huge claim. I mean, can you right, trust but when, that, them? You know what well, I mean? Well, when we're talking about the question of what qualifications the witnesses need, and that's the quotation that you gave us from Hume, right? Yeah. So yeah, when right. we're talking about that question, then the issue is just, do they have qualifications adequate for what we're asking them to testify to? It's a separate question. Did they testify to it? Hey, you know, we can look at the documents. We can talk about that question. But the question, are they qualified? Mm -hmm. Well, come on. That's, that's not, uh, you know, what is that? It's, you're asking them to testify to something that's very simple and straightforward. And we all do that all the time. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah, the qualification issue, right, right. So okay. that, because that's what Hume was saying, right? You know, right. of such unquestioned good sense, education and learning of such undoubted integrity. Eh, you know, right. what did they stand to gain or lose by this? Right. If they, if they were going to get a vast fortune for telling a lie, that would be one thing. But actually what they got is a lot of grief from the Romans, from the devout Jews who heard their testimony and said, no way shut up you can't you can't do that we're not listening to you and they had just procured the crucifixion of jesus so it was clear this was not without danger and right. these witnesses endured labors and dangers and sufferings voluntarily so yeah that's that's my take on that one yep um so we have skepticism out there about trustworthy trustworthy testimony um that's another skeptical problem sadly um and uh, we'll go one last one on Hume. So you already kind of talked about this a little bit, but he believes the evidence is always greater, um, you know, for regular events than the rare. I, I always found this argument of his to be the weakest one of all. I just don't understand why this is so convincing to others. I mean, don't we have all kinds of rare events in history and the history of life that we all believe in? I mean, that sure. they're there and I just never understood why this argument is supposed to be so great. What is well, he's so setting up an opposition between the regularity and the exceptional. And he's trying to say the regularity is unbroken. It rules out the exception. But none of us has observed all of space and time. And so what evidence we have, even what evidence we have when we talk with one another and pool our evidence, is still only evidence for a great deal of regularity, which turns out to be exactly what we would expect if miracles do occur rarely and function as signs. We need that regularity as the backdrop against which we evaluate it as a sign. So I just think this argument is the most spectacular non-starter that you could ask for. It really, it sounds good on the surface, right? Oh, I'm gonna go with the more evidence instead of the less. And then you realize, but I would have a lot of regularity if a miracle did occur and function as a sign. So I've seen a lot of regularity. I've kind of seen the thing that I would expect if miracles did occasionally occur. Oh, now what do I do? This is not impressive, but it does. Yeah, yeah. The beginning of the universe, I mean, is a one-time event. I mean, the beginning of life is a one-time rare event. I mean, I can think of a host of things. So I don't really... I just don't understand. <laughs> I guess I'm baffled why so many people think he is like the greatest uh, thinker ever. Of course, he had a lot of time to think, but I'd say the greatest thinker ever. And he's not an atheist. He wasn't an atheist or anything, by the way. People know that, Tim. I think he wasn't any kind of, I don't think he was any kind of, you know, professing. You know what I mean? He wasn't, what was his? He, I mean, he, he, was, like a, he was coy about that. Okay. He met a woman at a party once who said, I'm very glad to meet you. I think we deists should know one another. And what he said was marvelous in its ambiguity. He said, Madame, I do not wish to be known by that name. <laughs> okay. Right. Does that mean he wasn't a deist? Does he mean he was, but he'd really rather not have been known by it? Just, you know, what are Who you going to do? Maybe but can... yeah. One okay. thing I will say, though, Eric, and, and this may help to sort of resolve the puzzle of his influence. Hume is a very persuasive writer. Hmm. When we strip down his arguments and we present them like this, 
we can lay a finger right on these things and we can say, all right, but you know, premise three here isn't, you know, that's not true. And so why should I accept that? And then you go and you read Hume and it's a bit like the voice of Saruman in the Lord of the Rings. Mm. He's got this voice that seems wise and reasonable and he makes others wish to appear reasonable themselves by swift agreement with him. And that eloquence that he has as a writer, and there's nothing wrong with being an eloquent writer. There's something that eloquence is for. Mm -hmm. But his eloquence as a writer sometimes masks the weakness of his argumentation. At least that would be my take on it. Well, it's kind of like in a debate when you're watching some of the debates over the years. Some of them have great rhetoric, like Chris Hitchens, you know, but the substance, just when you listen, I'm looking at the substance going, God, that's really not very... It's not much substance there, but gosh, he's great at the rhetoric and people love that rhetoric, you know, and yeah. it's just too bad that, you know, people eat that up versus looking at the substance sometimes, but that's the way it goes. Um, so when it comes to the um, the standard kind of claim, you know, that we always need, you know, extraordinary claim requires extraordinary evidence. Um, obviously, I always say, you know, the extraordinary word has to be defined, but how much evidence do you think do you respond with is needed for, uh, I mean, the resurrection is a different claim. It's not something that happens ordinarily, as you said, you know, obviously, yeah. but I mean, how much evidence is really needed? Is this just sufficient evidence is all we need to provide? Is that how you kind of respond to that? Just like any other amount well, of evidence or what? Nobody wants to be a chump. Yeah. Nobody wants to be deceived. Nobody actually goes out there and says, I hope I'm deceived into believing something today that I shouldn't. I'm, I want to join a cult. Let me find one and I'll sign up. Nobody walks out wanting to do that. Hopefully. <laughs> so, yeah, let's let's hope. If they do, they're lost already. Um, so the, the question is, you've got something that's out of the ordinary round of events. I think you can justly require more evidence for that than for an ordinary claim. Mm -hmm. If I say my Uncle Tom died, that's a claim that requires less evidence than if I say my Uncle Tom died and rose again. Okay, got it. Check. But what I'm concerned to say is we can't put a factual claim completely beyond the reach of evidence. It might require a lot of evidence. We might say, wow, I am not holding my breath for that evidence to come in. And I think we should have standards. Let me give you a few that I'm getting from an old book. So you mentioned the Library of Historical Apologetics. This is a book by John Douglas called The Criterion. It's a book that came out um, just in the latter part of the 18th century. So around the time that Hume died, Hume died in 1776, the year of the American Revolution. Douglas says, look, there are some criteria that we can apply as a kind of a filter to enable us at least provisionally to set aside proposed miracles as unpromising places to look. That doesn't mean they can't have happened but you have at least an excuse for saying, I'm not really going to run out and invest a huge amount of time in this one right now. One of those is if the first report of the supposed miracle appears only long after the events took place. So, oh, you know, Pythagoras uh, died and came back to life. Who said so? Some writers writing 800 years after his supposed death. Anybody earlier? No. Eh, come on, that's a, that's a really long gap. There's time for the growth of legend to supplant whatever really happened. And so, yeah, you know, if it's really long after, or if the first report appears only far, far away from the location where the events are supposed to have occurred. So uh, Philostratus has a life of Apollonius of Tiana. Mm -hmm. He's writing in the early third century, Apollonius is supposed to have lived in the first century, same century as Jesus. And uh, he tells about some miracles that were supposed to have happened with Apollonius in India. Now he's writing in Rome for a Roman audience and they're not gonna go traveling over to India to find out about these things. And the reports are also from a long time ago. So those kinds of 
reports are less promising places to start. Could it have happened? Sure. I mean, it's it's a factual question. Uh, should you drop everything and go off and try researching them? Well, they're hard to research precisely because the reports are long ago or far away. Uh, a third criterion, if the miracle might have been, or the miracle claim might have been allowed to pass without investigation, maybe because it fell in with the prejudices of the people among whom it was reported. So there are some miracles reported in Jewish tradition of the Baal Shem Tov. Mm -hmm. And they circulated among the faithful, but there is no group of people standing around saying, yeah, no, plus let's crucify you for saying that. There's, there's no hostile group to cross-examine them. In my debate with Bart Ehrman, Bart tried to bring up the claims about the Baal Shem Tov. And I said, so where's the hostile audience? And he just said, what? Proving mm -hmm. that he needed to read some older works. They could have been useful to him. So there are some criteria that we can apply to sort of filter out less promising things. When you do that, you find that the evidence for the resurrection of Jesus passes through those filters and very little else does. So this is the most promising place to start looking if you're going to look. And that's why Antony Flew, uh, even when he was an atheist, said, look, the evidence for the resurrection is just totally different in quantity and quality from the evidence for any other miracle claim. It's, it's basically going to be this or nothing. This is the place where you've got to look. So the earliest, like, we've got the earliest records with Paul for the resurrection. They're really early. Geographically, they're all, it's starting in Jerusalem. It's not, you know, talked about in Asia or somewhere far away. And then the third thing was, um, what was the third criteria, third one? That, that there was a hostile environment. Hostile, so yeah, you have hostile there'd be, witnesses. Right, there'd be yeah. people who would be very right. happy to disprove it on the spot, ready and willing and able, if it's just some kind of pious fraud, to blow mm -hmm. the whistle on it. So you and, got some criteria, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So those, those are reasonable criteria. Those are topic neutral. I haven't built Christianity into those criteria, space, time, hostility. Those are just very general things. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. when we have something that passes through those filters, then that's something where we probably ought to sit up and take notice. And if we're going to start our investigation of miracles, right? Oh, there are so many miracle claims. Okay, put them through those filters first and see what comes out. Mm -hmm. Not much. Right, because you got because you have other miracle claims in some other religions and some things. People bring those up. They ask, "Well, why are you so biased against those?" And what about you're only open to the biblical miracles, you know? So if we have some criteria to use, that really helps. Um, indeed, I agree. Um, very good. Um, I think I skip that Ehrman objection. We kind of already covered that. Um, let me cover this last one here. So what about the um, you know the scientists you know that uh, studies only the natural world, but they're just so convinced that, you know, any miracle claim will just keep looking for a natural explanation. I mean, that it kind of just seems like it's already written off to begin with. I mean, you know, they're already science is only set up to look for the natural things anyway. So it kind of seems silly, doesn't it, to just kind of throw that out there? In yeah, a way. I mean, think about the definition of a miracle going back to what J.L. Mackey said, which is very much consistent with what Lewis said and the kinds of things that Mike Lacona and Frank Beckwith said that you quoted back earlier. Um, a miracle's not supposed to be the kind of thing nature does by itself. When mm -hmm. we're looking for natural explanations, we're looking for how nature behaves when it's left to itself. We're not looking for what, how it behaves when a supernatural agent intervenes. We don't call that part of a scientific law. We call that a miracle. It's a little bit like somebody who's just got a metal detector that he's going to use for finding, you know, coins and lost keys out on the beach or something. And he finds the studs in the wall of his house. He's like, this thing is great. And you say, fine, but I haven't lost something metal. I've lost my plastic comb. Oh, no, let me rev up my metal detector and look for your plastic comb. Mm -hmm. No, you're using the wrong tool. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't see it here, so I don't think your plastic comb exists. Wait, you're using a metal detector. It's not, it's not designed to pick out plastic combs. What, what, this is just the wrong tool. Natural laws tell us how nat nature behaves when it's left to itself. When we're talking about a miracle, we want to know, was nature left to itself? That's a separate, different question. Robert Boyle, who was a friend of Isaac Newton and one of the founding people in the scientific revolution, does a really nice job of this. He says, basically, it behooves Christians to know as much as they can about the natural world so that they'll know its scope and its limits. And that way 
they will neither be deceived into thinking that something is a miracle, which is really just an extraordinary effect of nature, nor refuse to believe that something is a miracle when they know that it does exceed the power of nature to produce. So yeah, we ought to look for natural explanations of things, but there are more ways to be unreasonable than by formally contradicting yourself. And if you're looking and looking and looking and looking for a natural explanation and there's not one, eventually the evidence mounts up and it becomes unreasonable for you to insist, no, I will hold out for this forever. Then if a miracle really has occurred, you are assured not to find out. And this is important. So let me just stress this point. One of the most important questions any of us can ask about anything is when should I change my mind? If I am wrong, how am I going to find out? And if you follow a kind of methodological naturalism that says, I am not allowed to let a divine foot in the door. I am not allowed to take that possibility seriously. Then if you are wrong, you will not find out. And that's a problem. It's kind of like when you do the the resurrection thing, you know, all the possible naturalistic explanations. I always pull this chart out with students, you know, like, you know, we can go over any of these. We can go over every one of them if you want. And you tell me what you think. If any of them have any evidence behind them, we'll take a look at each one. But there's only so many. I mean, you know, I mean, like we can, I don't know if there's another one out there. Jesus was an alien here on the far right. So that's one of the more current ones, which is a weird one. But, you know, the point is that, you know, I said, let's go over them if you think there's a better alternative to the bodily resurrection. And you know, they just sometimes don't yeah. know, you know, a lot of times. So, you know, it's not like we're against looking at these, you know, we can do that and go <laughs> over each one. But um, okay, let me wrap up with one last practical question about outreach, just talking to people and approach. Um, so Lewis said, um, you know, if, if God exists, obviously that puts miracles on the board, you know, and when it comes to, you know, you've seen a lot of debates, you've done a lot of work academically. Um, do you think that, uh, you know, I think you rent, I know you're more in the evidentialist uh, side of things, but do you, and you did, you also were part of the, the uh, Blackwell Campaign in Natural Theology. So do you believe that it's more beneficial to with, take someone that doesn't believe in God and just, they're open, but they are open. Okay. They're not like a turned off, hardened skeptic, but they are open to look at it. Do you think it's more advantageous to uh, practically start with natural theology and start with things outside the Bible to carve out the plausibility of the existence of God or else just go straight to the resurrection, say, you know, like, like Lacone and Habermas, Habermas say, if Jesus rose from the dead, game match, God exists, it's settled. God, the Bible is the one true God. It's all settled. Or do you just meet the person where they're at and call it a day? I mean, what, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I am reluctant to endorse a one-size-fits-all approach on this. Okay. I think you need to talk to people. Some people need the evidence that there's a God before they're willing to listen to anything about a particular religious tradition. Mm -hmm. Some people are ready to accept that there's some kind of higher power, but they really want to know why your religion rather than another. And there you want to do a historical argument for the trustworthiness of scripture. And in particular, the gospel accounts, the book of Acts. Uh, some people are just hurting. And what they need isn't an argument. What they need is somebody to sit with them and hurt with them and shut up. Mm -hmm. And so it really, it varies so much. I'll tell you, you, you talked about doing a Ratio Christi table at Ohio State. We've had tables like that here at Western. And uh, one of my friends, John Meyer, was out at our table uh, one day. And a guy came along and started throwing arguments at John, like, you know, one after another, rapid fire. Mm -hmm. Now, John has a master's degree in philosophy, and he's been doing this for a while. So he said, OK, well, that's a good question. I think you'd have and he'd start to make some distinction. And the guy would just run over him like a steamroller with a different one because mm -hmm. he saw that John had something to say to that. And every time this happened four or five times, every time John started to make a calm, reasonable answer, the guy would just shout out a different objection. Mm -hmm. And finally, John just stopped and he sort of looked him in the eye, tipped his head. He said, can I ask you a question? What happened? And the guy got really red in the face and said, I don't want to talk about that. Mm. Okay, there's a that that you don't want to talk about. Mm. 
And all the objections were just a smokescreen for a lot of pain, mm -hmm. personal pain that he was going through. There are people who've been hurt by those who claim to be Christians, maybe are Christians. So I'm, a, I'm big on the evidence. And if you ask me, well, what's your approach to defending the faith? My approach is to give evidence, evidence, evidence. That's how I'm wired. I think that's wonderful. But sometimes people are in pain. Sometimes they won't listen to the evidence. Sometimes they need your friendship. Sometimes they need a story. Sometimes they need something that is different from what you find easiest to produce. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, if they need evidence for the existence of God, give them evidence for the existence of God. If they need evidence for the truth of the New Testament, give them evidence for the truth of the New Testament. If they need an image of what it could be to believe in God and not be a complete jerk, give them that. Give them that in your life. Give them that in the records of other people who have lived the way they believe. Give them that in good fiction that depicts these things sincerely, but find out what it is the individual needs. It doesn't have to be what I would reach for first. Um, one of the things I found, and I bet you found it too when doing campus ministry, is that God doesn't play fair, right? I got out there and I was like, finally, a student wants to meet with me. This is great. I'm all set. I have books in my backpack. I'm set to go. We sit down. He picks up his coffee, takes a sip, puts it down, looks me in the eye and says, I've been addicted to pornography since I was 13. Mm -hmm. I go, this is not fair, God. I was ready to argue for the empty tomb. Right. Yeah, but that wasn't on the agenda today. I didn't send you an exam paper. I sent you a human being mm -hmm. and he's got a problem and you've got to meet that problem where it is. Mm -hmm. And so you, you can't just assume in any human encounter that your prepackaged answer is everything you're going to need. It mm -hmm. almost never is. That's not going to happen. God doesn't no, no. that way. No, it doesn't work that way. I know that from experience. Um, yeah, I just remember this debate, this lecture we had. Uh, I mean, I don't, I'm not trying to pick on Mike and Mike's a friend. You know, we had, when he had uh, Mike Lacan here to lecture on the resurrection years ago, he gave his evidence. And then this atheist stood up the Q&A and She's like, it seems like you're presuming the existence of God to begin with, you know what I mean? Before you're you're assuming that God exists, you know, before you're giving your argument for the resurrection, you know. So I felt like Mike in the QA had to go backwards and do some natural theology. He actually started talking about near-death experiences because Gary, you know, knows a lot of that. Right, right. Yeah. And so I felt like he had to go backtrack and change his apologetic kind of methodology. And you know, it was just interesting watching that in action. He did straight historical apologetics, then boom. You had to kind of go backwards. So that happens sometimes. But it's yeah, just, and and the, atheist, the atheist kind of caught it. You know, she's, she was just like, you know, it seems like you're assuming miracles are possible and kind of like what we're talking about tonight. I mean, that doesn't happen all the time, but it was just kind of an interesting uh, night. In that well, in fairness, you probably brought him in to talk about the stuff that he's written about, that he's a specialist right. in, right? right, right and so right. he did that. And then there's nothing wrong with doing that. But yeah, when you find out that you're talking to somebody who's got a different sticking point, Right. And you, you have to adapt. Right. And that, that doesn't mean Mike was doing what he was doing badly or that it was the wrong thing to do. No, but, no, no. but it does yeah. mean that. All right. Now, you know, the audience we're, has been revealed as having a different set of sticking points than the ones I was addressing. So now I've, I've got to be nimble on my right. feet. So that can happen to anybody. Right. And like, you know, when Doc, when I had William Lane Craig here, of course, you know, he did his six arguments outside the Bible or seven, you know, and Frank Turk, of course, starts outside the Bible. And most of the guys we've had here have been classical apologists. Most of it, I mean, James Warner Wallace, you know, he does his God's crime scene. That's outside yeah, the yeah. Bible. So, you know, it's, it's just interesting. Everyone's got their certain style. And um, I don't know, you're right. Just meet the person where they're at. So that's what it boils yeah. down to. Okay. Well, um, let's uh, go ahead and go get get off this uh, slide here. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and open up some people. Have some questions for Dr. McGrew. Um, I don't see anything in the chat room yet. Uh, sometimes you guys type your questions in the chat room. Maybe you just want to talk orally tonight, which I'm sure uh, Dr. McGrew doesn't have a problem with that. So, does anybody want to ask any questions about miracles or shoot some things at him? Otherwise, I'll keep talking as usual. So, anybody got anything tonight? You had a lot of questions last week about near death experiences, but. Uh, Anybody open to talk about anything tonight? I have a question. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Dr. McGrew, for being with us tonight and for sharing. Sure. Um, I was thinking about the passage in Acts where uh, Paul appears before King Agrippa 
um, and he was saying that he's um, none of these things had escaped his notice um, because this hadn't been done in a corner. Right. And so, what would you say if people asked you? okay, like, you know, Jesus fed the 5,000 or whatever, you know, we know that there were Jewish people that worked in Herod's palace and stuff like that. Why aren't there more writings about the miracles in extra biblical, um, like in a resource that would be, you know, just maybe a Roman, the, the centurion could have gone back and recorded, hey, this is what happened to, you know, um, the healing and, and things like that. Like, why don't we see more of that? Right. I, I think there are two levels of answer. They're compatible with one another. Mm -hmm. But one of them is that the primary means of communicating these things was to talk to people. Mm -hmm. We're now a culture that's all focused on writing. We write Twitter posts. We write Facebook posts on our walls. We write blogs. We write emails to one another. But this was a culture where the primary means of communication was to just go out and speak to the people who were right around you. In the fullness of time, and I don't think it took a terribly long time, people began collecting and writing these things down. But when Luke came along and in the prologue to his gospel, he said, many have already undertaken to write an account of the things that have happened among us. And I've been acquainted with these things from the beginning. So it seemed appropriate that I should write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may have certainty regarding the things that you have been taught. So there were apparently some others floating around. When there are little scraps of things written down floating around and then out comes some authoritative, well-written, thorough gospels by people who either knew Jesus personally or have had extensive contact with the people who knew Jesus personally, there's not a lot of need for these other little stories to be kept. There were such things, and just occasionally we catch a glimpse of them. So, for example, in the book of Acts, Paul says, you know, or is it in, in Acts or is it in one of his epistles? It's in one of the epistles, I think. He says, keeping in mind the words of Jesus, that it is more blessed to give than to receive. You can't find that in the Gospels. It's not there. Clearly, oral community had saved that saying of Jesus, and it was passed around to the point where it was common knowledge. This is something Jesus said. Many other things Jesus said had made it into the Gospels. That one didn't. So we have that little scrap as something that's outside of the Gospels, but inside Paul's letters that's a direct saying of Jesus, or as close to direct as, as you could want. So I think most people didn't write these things down. They spoke them. And when they did write them down, there was no need to preserve little fragmentary things once we had more coherent, woven together narratives and multiples by people who were of such a standing as to command the attention of the growing Christian community. So those would be the sort of two parts to my answer. Does that help to answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank you. And okay. yeah. You have another one? Go ahead. Oh, no, I was going to say it was an Acts. It is in Acts 20 where Paul. It is an Acts. I, I wondered. Okay, good. Right. Yeah. There we go. That is helpful. Thank you. It is interesting, Acts, that he does say that these things weren't done in a corner. You know, they're done in the public uh, public right. sphere, you know. So it's not like a private, personal thing. Um, very interesting. I know you've studied Acts, the historicity of Acts. You've done lectures yeah. on Acts. So, Let me just do one more thing connecting to what Carla said and, and this thing about it not being done in a corner. When you consider the explosive growth of Christianity right at the outset, thousands of people on the day of Pentecost, and how even the Roman historian Tacitus in his Annals, book 15, says, oh, this superstition once checked by the crucifixion uh, broke out again not only in Jerusalem, but it spread all the way to Rome. So he even notes that it started in Jerusalem, right? That took place very much in a context where something had to overcome a lot of resistance. Just consider how weird Jesus is as the Messiah by the standards of his contemporaries. They had 
a very high view of the special place of the Jewish people. And Jesus doesn't say you're not special, but he does say people are going to come from the east and the west and sit down at Abraham's table. They placed a very high value on a very strict view of keeping the Sabbath. By their reckoning, Jesus broke it frequently. It's not exactly the kind of religion you would build if you wanted to persuade first temple or second temple first century Jews that this was the the promised Messiah. And yet people did come into the way, the Christian movement in droves. Why? I think part of the answer is exactly what Paul says there. These things were not done in a corner. It was notorious. They knew it. There were enough people they knew who had been witnesses of it. They couldn't deny it. And this is why it spread so rapidly at the outset. Yep. And yeah, resurrection, forget it. No resurrection, nothing. I mean, dead, dead, dead Messiah, forget it. That would right. knock, it, knock it out right away. Um, okay. Anybody else uh, have a question? Anybody else want to take a next one? Anybody? Don't be shy tonight. Because I'm going to ask another question if no one's going to ask a question. Anybody? Boy, they're quiet tonight. Carly, got another one? They want to say anything. I look like somebody wants Richard. Richard, yeah, go, go ahead. ahead. Uh, when I was an atheist, I was an atheist because I had the wrong concept of the nature of God. The old man in the sky, and that's all I had. So you could talk to me to your blue in the face about inspiration, about miracles. I know there's no God, so you know it's not going to have any impact. So until someone was able to come along and say, here's the biblical concept of God, and it was different, and then that opened up all kinds of doors. And I think a lot of people are stuck in that thing. They know there's no God, so we do need to address that uh, early on. And I, I use an example. If I say to you, what color is the sky, and you can't say blue, you know, you're not going to get anywhere with that. You can't use any synonyms either because I'll spot you. I'll smoke you out on that. <laughs> so I just think we need to really be aware that some atheists are atheists because the, the, the concept of God's bad. And I find that a lot. I've talked to atheists and a lot of times they're working with this misconception of, of a physical God or, you know, something like that. Right. I think that's right. And I think it even extends to say why some theists are not Christians. Bad theology is real. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And sometimes they've picked up that bad theology through who knows what means. Sometimes they've picked it up because somebody's actually taught it to them. Sometimes yeah. they've picked up the idea that Christianity means being a terrible person because they've encountered terrible yeah. people right. who are claiming to be Christians. And God help us. That, that really happens too. And the thing to do then is not to say, no, no, no one who claimed to be a Christian would ever behave like that. No, no, shut up and listen, yeah. right? Hear what they've gone through and don't just assume that nobody who ever professed Christianity would do that. There's, I have known people who profess Christianity who have done some of the most horrible things and are some of the most horrible people that you would ever want to avoid and man, if I were persuaded that's what it means to be a Christian, yeah. I wouldn't do it. I would be just morally blocked off. So I get that. Bad theology, bad idea of what this whole Christianity thing is about, wrong concept of God are absolutely huge. Yeah. And this is, again, you know, I said in, in a way, if all you've read are a few books of apologetics, God won't play fair. This is why you actually need to study some theology if you want to go out and have these conversations, because you need to be able to say, yeah, actually, that's not what Christianity is all about. That's not what it teaches. I think you've got a non-Christian concept there. And if that's what I thought Christianity were, I would agree with you, but it's not. Let me show you why. But that means more work for us. So, hey, but on the other hand, that work involves reading more books. So like, what's not to love? Where do you think they get all that bad teaching from? Is it just the churches themselves or like upbringing or where does all this come from? I mean, it's occasionally it's an answer. I mean, that's a long topic in itself. But I yeah, occasionally it's the churches, but I've seen so many cases where I've sat in the church service and I've heard someone who knows what he's doing give a really thoughtful sermon on the Trinity. And he explains very carefully what it's not and what it is. And then I'll be in that church's youth group 
and I'll hear one of the teenagers trying to explain the Trinity. I know that kid was in the service. And it's like, so it's like there's three gods. No, stop. And it's not the pastor's fault. I've seen that happen so many times that I have just concluded that we're not very good at listening. And I don't know how to solve that. You can say, all right, then let's have only the most dynamic, the most engaging speakers who can actually hold people's attention. And that's kind of an issue in itself because then we end up choosing our speakers because they're really good at speaking. Mm -hmm. And as we all know, you can have world-class communication abilities and not actually have your heart be where your heart ought to be. Maybe and it's technology too, the technology thing. Maybe, but I think there have always been sophists, right? I mean, hey, I'm a philosopher. Socrates had all these run-ins with the sophists. They were the people mm -hmm. who prided themselves on being able to persuade anybody of anything. Mm -hmm. We can fall for that too. And so it's, I don't really have something magical to offer you except for one word. It's not magic. It requires a whole lot of work and it's the word discipleship hmm. which involves not outsourcing the growth of the individual christian to a pastor who can barely remember the names of half of the people in his congregation and is up front after the makeup artist has done the best to make him look great and is up there with a microphone on and is saying oh i look i've been up there with microphones i i, I get it but discipleship has to happen in a more intimate context Jesus wasn't discipling the 5,000. He had a small set of disciples and he invested heavily in them. We need discipleship to get around the problem of our really not being, uh, doing a very good job of getting good theology and enough of it and systematically interconnected out there simply by, via the medium of saying, well, go to church and then you're, you're good. That isn't doing the job adequately for many people. So we need individuals to invest in individuals. We need older people to take younger people under their wing. We need to involve women because newsflash guys, we shouldn't be discipling younger women, not a thing, stop that. So that's half the human race, which means we've got to involve the women as well. We need godly women who can take other women under their wing and disciple them. We need people in communities that we can't reach out to. There are communities where I really have no traction at all. Maybe ethnic communities where, because I'm a white guy, I'm not probably going to be the person that's gonna have people listening to me, not even at a coffee shop very much. So we need to be doing this full court press where we get back into discipleship and we train people to go out and make disciples. And that involves more than merely having the right concept of God and having good theology, but not less. Right. It takes a lot of work. It just takes yeah. a lot of work. Doesn't come easy. Um, okay. Anybody else? Any of their comments or questions? Maybe a couple more. Anybody? Anybody? Tim, why don't you, since uh, someone's maybe going to ask about it, there's one thing I did want to ask you. It's very important about this whole thing. Um, for you personally, what would you say for some of us that have been coming to these sessions? What is the value of apologetics? I mean, you know, I've taught this, you know, we've been on these calls, but what, from your perspective, what, you know, some people we've heard objections, apologetics, you and I, like it's not needed, it's too heady, it's only for the really smart people, it's not for the layman, or you only need the Holy Spirit in your life, or, you know, it's just too much intellectualism. You've heard all the objections over the years. So, what, What's some of the good reasons you think why part of Christian discipleship has to have that brick in their foundation, that it's absolutely necessary, especially this day and age? Right. Let I mean, me it's tell always you, been needed, but yeah. Sure. Let me tell you two stories. I'll try to do it briefly. Um, one story, I am meeting with a pastor mm -hmm. of a church, and I'm trying to get him interested in historical apologetics. We're having a meal. He, he's willing to accept some files on a hard drive. He doesn't you know, spurn that. But he explains to me very kindly that he's sure that there are some people and some young people who have questions about their faith, but not in his denomination. In his denomination, the young people don't actually have questions. Hmm. 
Okay. I'm I'm dumbfounded. I barely know what to say in the face of such a statement. Like you never heard that before either. <laughs> can't be serious, but he was. Yeah. And I didn't hear anything more from him for about a year and a half until I got a desperate email from him one night saying that his own son had just told him, yeah, dad, I haven't been a Christian for a while. Hmm. So there's one reason, right? Hmm. Because you actually need to give the young people something that they can see is reasonable before they decide they don't have a reason to hang around. It's much harder to have a conversation with somebody who thinks he's figured out that this is all BS than it is to have a conversation with somebody who says, oh, I've got honest questions, but I'd really like answers. Mm -hmm. So that's one story. Here's a second one. I know someone, and you probably know him too. He's a fairly well-known figure in apologetic circles. He gives talks at conferences, and uh, he told me privately, so I won't name him, that there was a time in his life when he was going through an awful lot of hard stuff, just family stuff, health stuff, financially, he was fine. He really couldn't hold it together financially doing the round of talks that he was doing. And he finally, he did a, an event one evening. He went back out to his car, got in his car and just broke down sobbing. Mm -hmm. And he said the, the little insidious thought crossed his mind, just just walk away from this. This hasn't, this, this hasn't given you anything. This, it's hasn't, this whole Christianity thing hasn't worked for you. Your, your life is a train wreck. This, you, you've got all these other difficulties. This isn't something that you need to keep doing. Just walk away from it. Mm. And he said, I could not do it because I knew too much. The truth of it. For yeah. him, yeah. when the emotions were just a storm all the other direction, that was the anchor that he could mm -hmm. hold on to. I saw somebody put something up in the chat. Um, if you minister to uh, people who don't start out as Christians, they're going to demand evidence. Whether they're willing to listen to it is a different thing, but they're going to demand that you have evidence and they're going to claim that you don't. And so you will be forced to bring up some reasons. You don't have to have all of the reasons, but by golly, it's if you don't have anything to say, you're not in the conversation. Have at least one thing to say. You know, that's that's not too hard. Richard, you look like you wanted to jump in. Yeah, just a, a comment. A friend of mine back in the 70s started a website. He was a hardcore atheist, became a Christian through science. And he started the website, Does God Exist for Atheists, Skeptics, Agnostics? He oh, I've was, been there. I've yeah, been. he was buried. <laughs> he was buried with questions from young Christians. And they're asking the same questions the atheists, agnostics, and skeptics were, but nobody was addressing them in their churches. So there's a void there that's definitely uh, real. Right. I remember getting a request from a pastor here in Southwest Michigan saying, I've got this really intelligent high school student who is asking tons of questions. Can you come up and talk to her? And so several of us went out for pizza, the pastor, his wife, my uh, sidekick, John, and I all went up there. And this young woman, she was not rebellious but she had a notebook with page after page of really thoughtful questions. And at a certain point in our conversation, I said to her, you, you go to a, a, we have this church, you attend a Christian school of the other young people your age. How many of them do you think have questions like this? Maybe not as many as you have, maybe not as well worked out as you have, but, but have these kinds of questions. And she thought about it for a moment. And then she said, probably all of them. And I, I glanced over at the pastor and his eyes got just a little bit wider <laughs> as he saw her say this. Like, yeah, this isn't just the occasional problem for which you call in the apologetic cavalry. This is Every young person in your church, in your youth group, they have the questions. They're not unreasonable questions. In fact, they're great questions. 
And, and instead of saying, hey, let's go roller skating. Hey, hey, let's have a pizza party. How about if we say, hey, let's dig into some of these. These are real. Because they're going to hear them from people. So. Yeah, yeah. You know, yeah, I mean, you know, I when, think older people, I think older people still have questions too, but you're right. It is, uh, yeah, starts young. Um, one comment some of the, the chat room were saying, I'm very involved with ministry to Muslims. I was not properly to defend my faith. If I didn't know how to defend my faith, they do not think Christianity is worth considering. Yeah, if you ever talk to Muslims like we do at one campus here, they'll they, they just come to you, bombard you with questions. So, absolutely. But here's well what I would it. say if, if you're <laughs> going to do that, and, and I'll say this about the Muslims in particular. There's no silver bullet, but you're likely to make more progress if you meet with them one on one than if you try to tackle them in groups. Mm -hmm. The social dynamics of tackling them in groups are such that they can't lose face in front of their friends. Yep. And so if they out. show any weakness, if they show any willingness to consider what you're saying, to be thoughtful about it, uh, then their friends would never let them forget it. So meet with them to the extent that this is possible individually, and you may find that they're actually more open as individuals than they are when they're in groups. But yeah. I completely agree with you. Yeah. You absolutely need to have reasons and otherwise you will get nowhere. Even sometimes when you have the reasons you get nowhere, but at least then it's not the, your fault for having nothing to say. Um, Petra asked this question about what do you do when somebody degrades you and makes fun of you? There are times when there are people who want to have conversations and there are times when they don't. And I think there, it's, it's absolutely fair to say, you know, if it seemed like you really wanted an answer to that question, I'd be happy to have a conversation with you. But you just keep interrupting me and mocking me. And so it's clear that getting an answer isn't what you want. You're here to try to score points or make me look foolish. That's not really a conversation I'm interested in having. So if you want actually to have an answer to your question, come back to me sometime and I'm willing to have that conversation. Just you know, don't don't get mad, don't get red in the face, but call them out on the fact that all they're doing is mocking and degrading. And let them have the last word, which they no doubt will, whether you let them or not, and just you know round it off gracefully. You'd be surprised at the impact that can have on the people who are watching. Even in a chat room, Sometimes the people who are watching will say, wow, you know, you behaved with grace and this other person was a real jerk. I don't, I'm not persuaded yet that you're right, but I'd sure like you to be right because you seem like the kind of person I wish were right. So maybe I will listen to you. Maybe I'll reach out in a private message and we can have a conversation. But if, if they are, as Karen says, just reflexively mocking, then no. Uh, that's not a conversation that you need to continue and you can politely let it go. That's, there's no problem with that. And that never happens on Facebook ever anyway. Oh no. Or on Twitter. <laughs> it's, you know, yeah. it's remarkable how thoughtful people are on Twitter, right? <laughs> no, yeah. Um, yeah. social media has a really poisonous effect on people. They do and say things there, that they wouldn't do and say in person. It's the yeah. weirdest thing. That's one of the reasons I left a couple of those those groups we were in. It just it just wasn't worth it. Some of the way they're the way Christians are treating each other. I'm like, this is such a poor witness. So Carl is right. You know, she says JP Moreland says we primarily learn apologetics and times of temptation and unanswered prayer come, we can stand firm. And like you said about your friend, you know, that that's I've noticed over the years when I if I get, you know, down or something, maybe like, you know, some sort of emotionalist who I think, what do I know is really true? If I go back to, I know it's true. I know this is true. I can't just, you know, I have to go back to what I know, you know, I mean, now maybe that doesn't hit some people emotional, emotionally. It doesn't do anything for them, but it does for me. Sometimes it's helped me, you know, maybe for other people, they're wired differently. I don't know, but for me, that's what I have to go back to. So, right. you know, um, some people say, oh, but I have, I have faith that God directly puts in my heart. Well, God bless you. That's great. I don't feel that. That's not the kind yeah. of person I am. So yeah. if you say, but what about that certainty that God gives immediately to every soul? I'm like, my soul had that module left out. Yeah, people are wired I don't, differently. Yeah, I, don't de I don't deny that some people may have that. What do I know, right? right? I'm just one guy. But I do say that that kind of personal assurance, if someone has it, is kind of like the white stone in the book of Revelation that has a name written on it that nobody knows except the one to whom it's given. 
it's not something you can share with somebody else. Oh, I feel this way. Well, you know what? I've got Mormon friends who feel something else is unshakably true. The feelings don't work it for me. And I, I've had people accuse me of not being a real Christian because I say, uh, no, I don't just have this direct spiritual illumination in my heart that does it. That's, I feel, well, you're, then you're, well, uh, you know, well, you know, uh, if, if that's the way that God has chosen to do it for you, if there's something between you and the Almighty that I'm not into, then bless your soul. But I don't have that. And yeah. I think it's very important that we not tell people that's normative. If you don't have that, there's something wrong with you. Right. That, I think, is a very dangerous thing to tell anyone. Lots of us don't have some kind of immediate certainty that all the doctrines we've ever been taught are true. That's just not the way that it works for at least many of us. Yeah, Mike, when Mike Lacona was here, um, I tell you a story. He, a woman in the audience, uh, you know, it was, this was years ago. She kind of, acute, she got mad at him because he expressed, you know, that he, his certainty for the resurrection used historical method was not, using the historical method, you know, alone was not as high as she wanted it to be. And he had unanswered some questions, you know, he said, I'm, she got really mad at him and said, well, I, I, you, you don't believe the word of God. She tried accusing you, you must not believe the word of God. And so yeah. it got in this kind of dicey situation. Mike's like, listen, you know, I'm just not wired like you. Like, I'm sorry. I'm just, it's just the way I'm wired. You know, we're not wired the same, you know, you need to give me grace and I give you grace. And that's just the way it is. You know, not every God's children are all wired the same way. We, we don't, you know, come to believe things exactly. So we just see, you know, so I, I think he handled it very well, but I could see the problem of just people saying, this is the way it, I've experienced it this way this way is for me and it needs to be that way for you and if it doesn't happen to you then you're not really a true believer you're something's wrong with you I think that gets really tricky and again I'm not denying that there are some people who may have some kind of a you know more direct connection and and feel this conviction brought home to them directly but I do know that there are people who say this about incompatible things Mm -hmm. There are certainly people who say this about the Book of Mormon. I testify, they'll say that Joseph Smith is a prophet of God and the Book of Mormon is a word from God. Well, you know, you can testify to that and I'm persuaded that you're wrong. So now we have a problem. Uh, there was a Christian philosopher a few years ago who wrote a public letter saying that he had had a profound religious experience of a personal encounter with the Lord Krishna, and now he's changed over to this particular version of Krishnaism. And like, right, either, either that's right, and I'm totally wrong with all the evidence stuff, or the evidence is still what it is, and something weird happens that persuades people sometimes that they've had a direct encounter with the supernatural that is of a kind that it's not, or is something really scary. Like if it is an encounter with the supernatural, just the wrong part of it. So, I, you know, I take the view that some people may well have something I don't have, and that's okay. I don't need it because God's given me enough evidence, and that's what I respond to. But I think it's very dangerous for us to say everybody must be like that. Then when people in a, in a time of personal pain and deep introspection say, you know what, I just don't feel that personal assurance, then they feel like they've just been cut adrift. I think the hiddenness of God problem gets really yeah. bad, right? I think God's just just taking a break from them, right? I had a Muslim. We had a Muslim yesterday. Literally, we went over the evidence for them about the Qurans written six hundred years after the time of Jesus, and why would you trust that about the death of Jesus over the first century witnesses? Muhammad didn't know any of the first century witnesses, and we literally spent half an hour with this Muslim girl. And finally, I looked at her and I said, "Do you believe? Do you want to have a belief that's? Do you care if it's true?" I said, "Do you care?" You want to believe something is rational? Isn't the more rational view that you trust the New Testament witnesses over Muhammad, which is six decades later? And she said, "Oh no, no, no! Muhammad's much more right. That makes much more sense to trust the Quran and Muhammad." And I, I said, "Let's go over it again." So I went over it again, and finally, but I realized Tim that some people just don't. They're just not. They just don't care sometimes what's evidentially true or rational that us just common sense. You know, they just don't care. Sadly. Even more than that, sometimes they don't even see the significance of things, even if they were to grant that they're true. So here, here's what sounds like the beginning of a bad joke. Uh, a 
Christian and two Buddhists walk into a bar. But it really happened. Um, I was giving a talk for a group called the Bible and Beer Consortium, and they meet in bars. <laughs> oh, I know who they are. I do yeah, and are. so I, I was giving a BBC talk, and uh, they met in a bar, and after I gave my talk, and you know, it was it's pretty excellent. well received, yeah, I got told, hey, you know what, there's a, a couple of Buddhists back here that uh, want to talk to you. I'm like, okay. So I went back. It was a, a college-age guy and girl, uh, clearly together, and... She was interested in uh, sort of Buddhism because she had had a really charismatic comparative religion professor who had turned her on to that. The guy was interested in Buddhism because the girl was interested in it. Um, and instead of trying to give them an argument for the resurrection, I, I, I just went straight for the heart of it. I said, look, if you were persuaded, whatever it took, that Jesus of Nazareth rose from the dead, that he was crucified, dead, buried, and that he came back to life, what would you do? I looked at the guy, the guy looked at the girl, <laughs> and she said, um, I mean, that would be weird, but I, I don't think it would really change anything I believe. I'm really comfortable with like my values and stuff. And I said, okay. That, you know, th thank you for being candid, but look at how much of a waste it would have been for me to sort of back up the dump truck and dump out all the evidence. Mm -hmm. Even if she were persuaded, it wouldn't have really changed right. anything. So, you know, you have to pray for those people that at some point they'll reach a point in their lives where they say, oh, now, wait a minute. Actually, that kind of would matter. And I don't know what that'll take. And I'm reluctant to say, you know, maybe the girl will dump the guy and the guy will come face to face with death in his family and he'll be saying, okay, death is not just another little thing for science to solve. It's not like pattern baldness or something. No, death is, is the big one and we need to come straight up against that. And if somebody rose from the dead, that would be really serious. And if it was Jesus, then he's not just the ideal boy scout helping little old ladies across the sea of galilee he is something much more important it's kind of like frank turk says to people you know you've seen it where he'll say if christianity yeah. is true would you be a christian you know, he just yeah, carly just flipped that up in the chat yeah yeah that's a car oh sorry yeah i missed that carla knows that we've had him here only like 17 times it seems but yeah that was his favorite question so it's a great question because it gets to the heart of the issue you know and so sometimes i'll go no it's like, why are you waiting in line to talk to me for 15 minutes if you don't really care? Why are you here tonight for two hours you yeah. know, if you don't really care if it's true? Why did you waste your time? So it's very interesting. All right. Well, let's go ahead and we'll go ahead and wrap it up here. I appreciate it. Um, we can um, I'll send out the recording. It'll go up uh, the next uh, 10 hours or so and I'll send it cool. out. But Dr. McGrew, thank you so much for taking your time. I know you're very, very busy and uh, I know you're going to be busy in the weeks ahead. Um, I always told you when if Someday I like to bring you to campus and do something, you know, down the line. And of course, you have to wait till like opens back up. We can have like events again. But I mean, right. yeah. going online yeah. stuff where you are is Western Michigan meeting in person. So we we are meeting in person for some classes and online for other classes. Yeah. My classes are in person. We we have to be distanced. We have to wear masks while teaching yeah. and everything. But it is, um, yeah. I I would rather be meeting in person than not. I don't know if you guys have this experience, but I found the students are just starved for human contact. Oh, well, you know, I what literally, they, do? they come back to campus even after the break, because even if all their classes are online, they still want to be on campus versus being at home in their parents' house stuck there. I, I literally have away. multiple people in both of my classes this semester who are not signed up for the classes. Some of them have taken that same course with that number at Western already got an A in it, but did it online and they want to have a professor they can talk to. And as much as I would like to think that I'm a brilliant lecturer, I think it's really because they want human contact. Yeah. And maybe yeah. for the first time in their lives, they're realizing that how much it matters after it was taken away from them for a semester. They said, oh, these online classes. No, 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 no. Not the same. Not the same no, at all. We had to do what we can. Classes. Right. But it's just not the same. Yeah, I, I've had students tell me, like, I came back just to be socially on campus. Like, I need to be around people. They're just tired of being cooped up in their homes. So I can yeah. well believe it. Yeah. So, well, listen, thank you so much again. Um, I appreciate so much. We'll be watching. Uh, everyone go to, you know, his website. Look up his YouTube clips. He's got all kinds of cool stuff. He's done lectures on Acts, the Gospels, 
all kinds of topics and uh, go online, read that article. But thank you so very much. I know you got a family or anything. You, so. you bet. No, but thanks to you, Petra, Carla, Karen, Julie, Georgia, all these people who are saying nice things in the chat. I do see what you're writing. I'm, I'm glad if you found some value in it. And Eric, good to see your face even at this format, <laughs> you know, and, right. and, and, and we'll try to make it better once things get back to whatever degree of normal we can hope yeah, for. Yeah, well, near. hopefully we can connect again. I'm sure maybe right. we'll see each other, maybe the SC, maybe an SES conference or something if they ever meet again or something, but uh, God bless you and uh, have a good spring and we'll, I'll follow up with this. Thank you. Blessings, Take care. Guys. All right. Thank you. God bless. Bye-bye. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. All right, everyone, does anyone want to say anything else? I'll stay on for a minute before we uh, get going here. What do we have next week? I'm trying to remember. I uh, Do I have, I think, oh yeah, next week, I think I have Dr. I think I have Michael Brown to talk about his new book, Anti-Semitism. Is anybody interested in, in anti-Semitism? Hey, oh, I thought you left, Dr. McGrew. I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry, I'll, I'll get out. Bye. Yeah, no, you can stay. I just, I, I sometimes stay on afterwards. Do it's all good. Want. It's all good. Yeah, oh, we'll, oh, Eric, share yeah. my email address with anybody who wants it. Happy to okay. correspond with anybody. You know how to reach me, so. Yeah, I sure right. will. I got it. You got it. Thank good. you so much. Take care. Yeah, but everyone, I will have uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Brown back to talk about his new book. I think it's next week. That's the week we have him on to do anti-Semitism. Um, it might be Clay Jones to come. So one or the other, I can't remember which one it is. But one of those two guys will be here. So we'll have a guest next week as well. So does anybody have any other questions or anything before I wrap it up about anything? Eric, I just really appreciate all these different people that you have um, talking. It's it, This is really great. They and sure do know their stuff, don't they? Email. Yeah, they know their stuff. Having access to their emails are great too. Yeah, they sure do know their stuff, don't they? So it's not yeah. like uh, they lack any uh, formal training <laughs> or anything. So uh, yeah, very they're all good. very good. I, I I I admire them too, to be honest. So they're yeah. all very good. Um, okay, well, uh, anybody who's not is anyone, and then on the email list uh, for the for the uh, weekly things, I'll type in my email down here again. If you're not on the regular email list, so email me and I'll add you to that again because some of you do send me emails that you need to be added. Um, so go ahead and write that down if you need my email address. Um, but uh, yeah, so, okay. Anybody else, anything? Any quick comments or anything else? Going once, as Daryl Box said, going twice. Three times the lady, the Commodores. Okay, no, anyway. Okay, well, let's just pray. Lord, thank you for this time. And uh, thank you for Dr. McGrew. Pray you just bless him and uh, give him strength and stamina in all he's doing. And uh, just thank you for everyone that's come. And I pray, God, you bless us the rest of the week. May we have energy and strength as we serve you whenever we do. And uh, Lord, we just thank you. You're working in our lives and that you are, you know, you are a God that's present. I pray, Lord God, that we'd remember that you're working in our lives every day. And may we see you working around us and may we not take that for granted. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, everyone, I will send out the clips soon and uh, God bless you all. Please email me if you need anything, okay? Thanks. All righty, God Thank bless. Thank you. Take care, bye. Thank